I am actually hoping that ifosamide just goes away, and I'd actually like to get to that subject soon. But before then, you know, one of the things that I was told when I was a fellow is that is if I was going to go into sarcoma, it was good to have a PhD because you were going to be dealing with phase two clinical data for the rest of your career. And I said, well, I have a PhD. That sounds great. And then all of a sudden, we started doing phase three trials left and right. And this field is actually maturing really nicely because you can do a phase three clinical trial in sarcoma now in under two years. And we're no different than anyone else, and we have these large trial-based centers that really make a difference. And I think, you know, we, we started with a very interesting maintenance mTOR study that was negative, but right after that came out the PALET study, and all of a sudden we had something that we weren't used to talking about, which was an FDA-approved drug. And that really began to change what we're doing and our thinking of what we wanted to push. So we actually had evidence-based medicine going into our treatments. And so, you know, Andy, why don't we instead of having you talk about ifosamide, take you over to pizopinib, which is now a Novartis drug that I use quite readily in the advanced line. And so, you know, maybe we can start by just having you discuss briefly, you know, how it's given, how you use it, and what are the, really the approved indications? Well, so pizopinib is a, is a pill. It's an a oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It hits a, a, a fair number of different kinases probably most notably are the vascular endothelial growth factor receptors, and in particular, VEGF receptor 2. It also hits KIT, um, which is important in gastrointestinal stromal tumors, uh, and, and other kinases as well. Um, it's taken orally once a day. Um, it's not entirely clear in sarcomas whether it's direct anti-tumor effect or whether it's an anti-tumor vasculatur effect, and it's somewhat irrelevant, I think, for that distinction, as long as it has some combined anti-tumor effect. The um, study that you referred to, the PLET study, followed on an earlier phase two study that was conducted, um, published by Stefan Schleifer uh, and at the RTC, which looked at patients uh, who were categorized into different um, subgroups of either lyomyosarcoma, sarcoma, synovial sarcoma, uh, adipocytic uh, sarcomas, or other tumor types. And in a single arm study, um, three of the four groups showed what appeared to be an improvement uh, on progression free survival compared to. Um, historical controls, um, and uh, the one group that didn't seem to have that benefit were the adipocytic neoplasms, and that's what led to Palette, which was a randomized study um, in patients who'd been previously treated um, either with pizopinib, uh, this study was randomized to pizopinib or to placebo. Yeah, and what's interesting is, and we can get into a discussion another time about the problems with, say, Simon design choosing of subtypes, which, you know, nicely there'll be a trial reported soon about Pazaf and Amidipocytic, which may actually solve that problem. But, you know, as we get into this, you know, there were a couple subtypes in the, uh, the pallet study that really stood out as having a little bit more activity than, you know, in general. And so, you know, Jonathan, do you know or remember exactly what those were? Yeah, you know, it seemed to show promising activity in, in synovial sarcoma, lyomyosarcoma, and, you know, those are certainly metastatic diseases for which patients will mm. clearly reach third-line third line therapy. And this is, is a, uh, you know, perfectly reasonable therapy for uh, additionally solitary fibrous tumor is an another histology for which, which I personally and, and our group will use pozopinib and second-line therapy uh, for, for that entity. Mm. And so it's, it clearly has activity in those histologies, but also has clear activity in a broad range of other soft tissue sarcomas, um, and probably in some that were excluded from the pallet study. No, I'd absolutely agree. So say, Shreyas, um, where are you incorporating this in terms of your treatment strategies now that we are getting a more complicated landscape? So again, I think we, with lack of true molecular markers mm -hmm. helping us subset the therapies out. We've used the poor men's way of doing it, which would be histology-based subsetting out, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think there would be tumors, like take the example of synovial sarcoma, as John just mentioned, that if they got toxorubicin phosphamide based regimens up front, we know that gemcitabine docetaxel has very marginal to low activity in that setting, but Pazopanib has reasonable or decent activity, so that would move up to second line. I, I don't think that the second line, third line 
usage is necessarily that generalizable these days. I think it's fair to say that the anthracycline based is front line, generally gemdocetaxel is the second line, and pazopanib becomes third line, but that will change as we talk about some of the other drugs that come along. And, and, and I think we're starting to pick out the patient populations where VEGF inhibition is very relevant. Take alveolar soft part sarcomas, for example. Uh, so, so there are subsets where it may make sense and would be used in the earlier lines of therapy, and there are others where it typically gets into the third line or beyond, depending on the patient's disease situation. And just informationally for, for the audience, uh, so in the children's oncology group, there was the non rabdos that I think everyone's aware of, but uh, 0332, for high-risk soft tissue sarcomas getting AI, and they for a variety of tumors, and they were, from that study, we really did see a number of tumors that we all know intuitively, alveolar soft part, epithelioid, MPNST, that were, were chemo-refractory, and now there is a combined study, COG and energy, with the pazopinib backbone for those types of tumors that are at high risk. So there really is some, there's really some momentum building with this drug. But that's a tough regimen. So just, and I didn't go into the details of the results of the Paulette study, but it did show uh, improvement in progression-free survival uh, four and a half, 4.6 months compared to 1.6 months for the placebo arm, but no significant improvement in overall survival. These were patients that were supposed to have completed all prior lines of therapy, but there were patients who continued to get therapy after that. But it does come, and I think it's one thing we should point out before moving on with the black box warning. And I think it's always important to know how to manage a black box warning. And so do you want to discuss briefly the liver toxicity? Well, I mean, it, it has a variety of different toxicities, including um, the potential for liver toxicity. Um, the, uh, the drugs of this class, I think, mm -hmm. share very similar toxicities, and um, uh, certainly um, LFT abnormalities, um, elevations in ALT, AST, and bilirubin are, are, can occur, um, and it has to be monitored very carefully, um, and either um, drug suspended uh, permanently or held until improvement and then dose reduced. The other toxicities we see are, are hypertension, which also mm -hmm. needs to be managed. Um, patients with or treated with VEGF receptor antagonists can get uh, palmar plantar erythrodysesthesias or hand foot syndrome, uh, oral dysesthesia, so mouth pain, which can be really quite um, symptomatic and limit oral intake. Uh, and we've, working with our oral medicine colleagues, have found that a dexamethasone mouthwash really improves that quite, um, sorry, that's the wrong drug, a uh, uh, clorazepam mouthwash really can dramatically improve those symptoms. Um, and diarrhea is another common toxicity. But all those things need to be watched and managed, and it's not just here, take a pill and come back and see me later. It's really close follow-up with the patient's important. Yeah. The liver LFT management is the one thing that ends up on the social media message boards because, you know, people can die if it's managed wrong. You spend a lot of time on those social media message well, boards. I think it's important as part of patient advocacy that you're also available to patients. 